Now, on the not so positive side, why do some projects fail to achieve good ROI? Um, and you'll notice that, uh, you know, one of the things that, so, you know, with the picture of a frozen waterfall in the background there, I think a lot of us have waterfall mentality. And I put myself in that bucket as well because I'm kind of old school and I, and I kind of like water, waterfall. I like to have, this is the beginning of my project. This is the end of my project. And I like to have a feeling of being complete. And, you know, maybe that's like the dad in me. It's like, we want to do a project around the house. We're going to get it done. We're going to feel good. So a lot of us have that. And monolithic projects tend to have that mentality in terms of how they work because of a lot of their case studies are monolithic case studies. And they, what happens in my experience is they tend to get frozen. They, they move along for a while and you're just about almost there. Things are pretty good and things like stay that way kind of forever. And this is how you get a multi-year, never quite finishing rollout. Um, yeah. And that comes to mindset, I think. Yeah, and I think people aren't even aware of it. So they, they you know, make the decision, we're gonna do a composable architecture and that's maybe a top down or maybe it's a specific person on the team that's driving that, but the whole team is not sold. The whole team has that mentality waterfall because that's how they've rolled solutions out. You can't blame that. Um, but the thing is, you have to make sure you have buy-in from the team members that you can silo systems, that you can, you know, you know, as I said earlier on one of the slides, throw away something if it doesn't work, right? That you know, do your first iteration, test it out. If it doesn't work, go back to ground zero. Don't continue down the wrong path, right? So um, it's it's not a mindset that's I would say common still, even though composability is really growing in in popularity, it's still fighting with that, you know, uh, waterfall mentality. So um, it's going to take time for people to understand and, and move into that. Yeah. Um, poor planning. And this doesn't mean you didn't do enough planning. Um, it could be that you planned too long term and you try to make all the decisions before you had all the answers. Um, a lot of the times it's not understanding the goals. And I think not understanding the near term goals enough and trying to focus on far too uh, far too far in the future is often yeah. a problem. But it all it does come down to what you were saying, John, is that alignment of the team. Do we, you know, a lot of people are if they're if they're having trouble, if they're having a problem, that's usually something that they want to see solved near term. And if we if we come with this big, you know, destination postcard of five years from now, it's going to be perfect. That doesn't necessarily take into account what's causing me pain right now. Um, and yeah. so I think planning needs to take all that into account. Yeah, and I think that kind of links back to the mentality one as well. So if you have the wrong goals, let's say you pick the wrong goal. So you have, you, let's, let's say you are good at picking a short-term goal and you roll out a component of your composable architecture and that short-term goal um, doesn't get verified for ROI. Like, did this work? Did this give us the return on investment we wanted? Are we stopping and checking that as we mm -hmm. kind of go along um, and pivoting? Right. So this is the this is the the issue of like not just having possibly the wrong goal, but making sure you're pivoting if it is the wrong goal uh, or wrong result. Um, yeah. You might have the right goal, but as you go through each stage, you're not checking as you kind of go if you're on track. Mm -hmm. um, that really messes up the whole planning because then your next iteration or your next kind of siloed project um, is building off something that's not successful. Yeah, right on. And so that verification, that comes to what I call testing. So if you test too late, or if you ignore your the results of your tests, you know, hey, this train's not coming off the tracks while I'm on board, you know, we're gonna keep on going in this direction and no matter what. So that's why it's important to get that, you know, early version one out the door. So we're, yeah. gonna, we're not gonna think waterfall, we're gonna think bunch of iterations. What's the quickest sort of bite-sized version one, minimum viable product that we can think of because we can then test it and verify it and we don't want to test it too late um, which is why i think a smaller just a smaller initial project something we can all hold in our heads we understand what the goals are and then we can verify that we know that it's it does all those things that we need it to do but it's not so much of an investment that if we don't like it or if we want to go a slightly different direction or change something that we didn't blow our whole budget yeah one one big thing i see is a big problem here too is people will break their project into small iterations, but there's no gap between the iterations. Mm. So you have no time to actually do real life ROI testing. Like what is the result of this? You jump into the next iteration and by that time you've kind of forgotten about the first iteration, right? You're, you're so consumed, you're, you're moving on to something next. And the trick, the problem here is that you 
your team needs to move on and people are so time crunched and people want results right away. So they want you to jump back on and work in the next iteration. So one of the things that we generally recommend is that you have, you know, your execution team, but you have your, your QA, but also your ROI testing team, right? So let's say, let's say I'm just using examples, two week iterations. So you do two weeks of building, and then you move on to the next iteration, two weeks. While you're on that next iteration for the execution team, that other team should be measuring the ROI of the very first iteration, right? And, and making sure, and that might take a month. It may take more than the, the duration of that second right. um, iteration. It may take time for you to get enough feedback from conversion numbers, from analytics, from trends to really see, is that making difference? So you have to build that into your planning in terms of how you do that. And you do really need a team that's not just the execution team to measure that ROI and test it properly at the right time. Right. So not only do we need to plan on how like building and rolling this thing out, but then verifying it after it's been rolled out before we do anything else on there. Exactly. It's one of the huge benefits of being able to roll out these smaller chunks is yeah. that you can try to get ROI earlier, but how do you know if you don't actually go back and verify it? Unless some people do like a six month, you know, stop and they start testing and, and you've kind of wasted the opportunity there. Yeah. Right. So if you can do it shorter, you'll get much better results. And you'll get better at it too. So in a long monolithic project, we only had to do one testing phase at the end. And so you only, if you only ever did that once, you don't really get good at it and you don't get good at shipping often, but part of, part of shipping often means testing often too. So we yeah. can get really good at ver verifying results and making um, objective decisions based on numbers and data. And just to clarify, when we say testing, that's not necessarily bug testing uh, in your software. This is testing the ROI, testing the results. Does this do what we want it to do? Is it helping us? Is it going to be a nice puzzle piece in our whole you know, right. portrait picture that we're going to make at the end of this journey um, that we're getting to? Yeah, nice. And the last, the last uh, note here should be obvious, but it's not. It's like projects fail because their timeline was too long. Um, and so a lot of times people will say, well, the project failed because we didn't have enough time. I would argue that's often because you set the timeline long enough that you really couldn't see the end. So it just seemed like it might be good enough. Uh, yeah, you know what, it's a year. And because it's really hard to kind of mindset, you know, in my head, how long is a year? So try thinking in maybe weeks instead of months or months instead of years. Uh, I don't know what the sort of the, how your organization tends to work, but shorten that time frames for versions uh, and, and sort of, so you can kind of step, uh, stair step or like, you know, build the puzzle as we were saying, John, so that you can kind of keep it in your head more easily about what's going to be done and what's going to be delivered and what's going to be tested. Um, that way it's not so far out that you don't really understand what success means and the milestones get too complicated. Um, it's just, just too darn hard uh, with long timelines. Yeah, I'll, I'll even look at the statement and say, you know, scratch out timelines. <laughs> like mm -hmm. what we need to change our mentality to is iterations, iterations, mm -hmm. iterations. And those iterations should never stop as a business. So I'm sure everyone here has heard the, the angle that every business is now a technology business, right? We're all looking at ways to use technology, to roll it out, to use these different platforms. I think the MarTech stack or the average number of platforms that are now in like a MarTech stack is just growing every year. So we always have more platforms, more things we're doing. Technically, our businesses are always changing. The market is, is adjusting. What we want to convert on today versus two years from now changes. So really the mentality should be, especially with the composable solution, that's why it's really great, is that it's always evolving and always changing. So if you can have smaller projects that you know you can iterate on and you can perfect the ROI on and stop thinking about, you know what, we're gonna redo all of our tech stack or we're gonna do this and this is gonna be a three-year project, like try to get rid of that mentality and just be like, you know what, what's the first thing we can do to get some ROI? What's the first solution or component we can kind of silo out and build and uh, focus on that and then focus on the next one. Um, so yeah, long timelines is kind of pushing you into the mentality that you're going to be done at some point because it's a timeline. You want to be done smaller projects that you can test the ROI on and pivot, but you don't ever really want to be done done. Mm. My pushback on this one that I have internally is there's some businesses that just inherently 
have aspects of their organization that slow things down. Um, yeah. So maybe, you know, I'm thinking of like financial institutions or insurance institutions, or um, maybe your legal have some kind of legal thing that you have to do that tends to slow down your work. Um, I, I hearken back to what you were talking about earlier, John, where it's like you leave a, first of all, leave a buffer, you know, give yourself enough time to be slowed down by a bit during like each of your phases. But also that's, if you have some aspect of your organization that needs like more approvals and things like that, that's something you should build into the testing phase, I believe. Um, and maybe you can test it before it gets rolled out for real. I'm not really sure, but don't be distracted by the business um, yeah. or legal. Um, you can sometimes you can roll on keeping that in mind with your iteration schedule. Well, an interesting aspect of that, which we didn't put in here as a slide too, that can make a project fail is the kind of concept of over over owning as well. Mm -hmm. So you're going to build out a proposable solution and there's, you know, five different platforms you're going to build out and they're going to be over different times. Do you have to do all of them? Right. Or can one of them be done by an, an agency or a partner or somebody like that? And a lot of people are like, no, we have to own everything. We have to control everything. But with a composable solution, you may be making the wrong call there because the whole one of the benefits is you can silo these things out and you can offer it to someone else. Maybe that doesn't disrupt your business as much as it normally would. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the case study of uh, previously with Cineplex is a perfect example where they've chosen where they have capacity, where they don't have capacity or where they have expertise even, so they can optimize certain projects and they may on the outsource certain components and not other ones. And that's, that can be a component of the same website or the same kind of even uh, platform. Um, it's really amazing what you can silo out when you really step back and say like, you know what, we want something specialized on one area.